Roger Thoreau has been a foreign correspondent for the Wall Street Journal for 20 years. He was based in South Africa from 1986 to 1991 during the last years of apartheid and in the early days of reconciliation, which ignited in him a passion for humanitarian and development issues. His reporting has taken him to more than 60 countries, including two dozen in Africa. Roger and fellow journal correspondent Scott Kilman's jointly written pieces in two 2003 famines were a finalist for the 2004 Pulitzer Prize in International Reporting. Their recently released book is titled Enough, Why the World's Poorest Starve in an Age of Plenty. Please welcome journalist, author, humanitarian, Roger Thoreau. Uh, and I'm very humbled uh, to be here um, because I've seen the great work that Opportunity International does, does in Africa and that's where the true humanitarians are uh, and your colleagues uh, out in the field and, and, and the marvelous things that they do and, and some of the things that we've, that we've seen. Uh, and including uh, uh, Francis Pellicamoyo, who's one of the, the inspirations uh, in our book, one of the heroes in our book. And so thank you to him and his team in Malawi and the folks in Africa for opening the opportunity door uh, for us as we were, were reporting and writing the book. Um, thank you for showing us your work in Malawi, and, and above all, as I said, thanks for the inspiration. I'll talk more about uh, Francis uh, a little later uh, and, and uh, read a passage from the book uh, about the great work that, that, that he's doing. And above all, I guess, thank you for the theme of the day and the topic of the, of the weekend and the conference, storytelling. I mean, it warms the heart of, uh, of an old journalist uh, for people to be so, so interested and be committing such, such time and attention uh, to it. And, and, and it's particularly timely now, uh, and, and especially in the war uh, on, on hunger, uh, because storytelling is, is extremely vital and a crucial weapon and an element uh, in the assault and the battle against hunger. And today we find ourselves kind of at this great moment of, of opportunity uh, in this battle against hunger. I guess I should say kind of a, a great moment of potential uh, opportunity. Uh, there's, there's a lot that's going on. The Obama administration, since its early, I guess, minutes, uh, in office, its first minutes in office, has made uh, ending hunger, reducing hunger through agriculture development one of its key uh, foreign policy priorities uh, and pillars. And I don't know if you remember in his, <clears throat> in his inaugural address, uh, but he said something after kind of going through all his domestic policies, what he was going to do with the economic crisis and things. He basically said something like, to the poor nations of the world, let me say that we will work to make your farms flourish and your clean waters flow to nourish hungry bodies, and to feed starving minds. 30 words is all that was. It was basically those 30 words that have, that have set the administration off on this course uh, to hopefully some in, some in the administration and, and uh, the State Department already talk about it being perhaps one of the legacy issues and accomplishments of the, of the administration if they can actually uh, kind of keep the attention focused and, and, and get Congress to go along with everything what they want to do. Uh, and, and, and since his inaugural address, he's, he's, uh, there's been a lot of, of action in, in the G8, in the G20. Uh, Secretary of State Clinton, in, in all her tra travels, particularly in Africa, she's talking about uh, this issue. Uh, it's kind of this multi-level, uh, multi-cabinet um, member uh, initiative uh, that includes the Pentagon, the National Security Council, um, and that's why they call it the Global F Hunger and Food Security Initiative, because they realize the vital aspect of, uh, of international security of, of reducing uh, uh, hunger and the stability that comes from that. So finally, what we see emerging is, is, this, is this political will and political leadership, particularly from the United States, which is crucial, uh, finally emerging after, after years and after decades of a neglect of, of the hunger issue uh, since the Green Revolution, uh, and neglect of, of, of agriculture uh, development. And what we see is kind of this call to action or this leadership from the, from the uh, political side kind of merging with a rising grassroots movement uh, that we see in, in faith-based organizations, uh, on college campuses, in corporate boardrooms, among you all here today, you know, and, and even including uh, among philanthropists. Although I guess it's, 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 it's a bit odd to kind of connect Bill Gates to the grassroots um, of anything. But, you know, this is the cer certainly the grassroots that's coming from on, on the agricultural initiative and really that's coming from the foundations and, and, and philanthropy with the Gates Foundation 
uh, leading the way. And he said in uh, a speech in Des Moines at the World Food Prize uh, last October, I think it was, and, and, and outlined clearly what, what the foundation's um, intention is, and we'll be hearing more uh, about that um, in a little bit. But he said, you know, their conclusion is that the best way to reduce poverty and help the hungry and, and reduce the hunger numbers, but the best way to reduce poverty in these very poorest of nations is by focusing on the small farmers and making, creating the conditions for the small farmers, particularly in Africa, to be as productive as possible so that they can uh, uh, grow enough food to feed themselves, to feed their families, perhaps some surplus to feed their communities, uh, the, wider, the wider nation, and maybe the nation then can, can export, and kind of uh, from, from the small farmers being this engine of, of prosperity uh, and economic growth. And we add to kind of all this, both the political leadership, uh, this grassroots movement, here comes then, and what's really needed is the power of, of, of storytelling. Because it is, it's storytelling that will truly set the grassroots ablaze. It will spark the imagination and, and the urgency, and hopefully create this wider community that, that, that was talked about, that, that, that storytelling can, can, can truly do. Uh, now, in terms of the power of storytelling, in terms of creating, creating the outrage, uh, and, 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 and hopefully sparking people to move, I just want to show you one, one ad that was in the Wall Street Journal, my former newspaper. Uh, full page ad on the back page of the front section. Uh, when I was there, th these full page ads used to cost $100,000. I'm not sure if, uh, if, if, it, if, it's, if it's been reduced or, or, or increased the price by, by Rupert Murdoch um, since he's taken over. But look what it says, if you can see this. This is from Allstate, the insurance company. They're pointing out, hey, if 12 fully loaded jumbo jets crashed every year, something would be done about it. I mean, you're darn right it would. 12 a year. And then they note every year, more than 4,000 teens die in car crashes. So it's, 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 it's an ad to create the outrage for teenage driving and, and, and the horrible loss of life that comes from that. It goes on to say, kind of the text be, below the headlines, when even one plane crashes, the story is in the headlines for weeks but the equivalent of 12 planes full of teens dying every, every year is barely a blip on the national radar. Allstate thinks it's time the carnage stopped. They're right, it's horrible, it's tragic. I'm the father of two teenagers and, and, and can fully sympathize and subscribe to that. But now listen to a couple sentences from our book. UN health and food organizations calculate that 25,000 people throughout the developing world die every year, or I'm sorry, die every day from hunger and malnutrition and related diseases. 25,000 people a day dying from hunger. Or, as officials of the United Nations World Food Program have grimly noted, it's the equivalent of 60 jumbo jets crashing every day. All states worried about 12 a year. 60 jumbo jets crashing every day. So where's our ad? Where's our full page ad on the hunger, on the 25,000, on the 60 jumbo jets crashing every day? They're right, 12 a year, something would be done about it, and ought to be. 60 a day, where's the clamor? Where's the outrage over that? That's what we need to stir up through our storytelling, and where storytelling fits in in the war on hunger. But before I kind of get into that, in our morning of storytelling, let me first tell you a little bit about my own Story, and I'll start by quoting uh, the words of another storyteller, a much greater storyteller, uh, who many of you, I'm sure, have, have heard about. He happens to share the same last name as me, only it's spelled differently. Uh, Paul Thoreau, the travel writer and novelist. I think he's from the, from the French Cajun branch of the family, and I'm from the Pomeranian uh, <laughs> side of the family with the, with the OW ending. Uh, and uh, obviously from, from a more gifted literary line. Uh, uh, than, the, than, than the Pomeranian branch. Uh, I, I think we have more discipline or something, but he's got the, he's got the literary vein. Uh, anyway, we were both at a nonfiction writing conference in Dallas uh, this past uh, summer, and it was run by a former Wall Street Journal colleague uh, of mine, which is, which is kind of the only reason I got, I got invited. Um, and during his speech, Paul Thoreau, he was kind of describing the difference between fiction and nonfiction writing. And what he said was that in fiction writing, you basically create the story yourself. You look inside yourself. You create the characters, you create the scenes, 
you know, perhaps it's based on real life, your own real life, or based on, by, based on reality, something you've seen. You know, but it is a world, essentially, that, that's, that's being created in your own mind. In nonfiction writing, Paul Thoreau said, you go out into the world and you seize the story. And you tell that story. You go out into the world and you seize the story. I like that. I thought it was really profound, and I wrote that down in my notebook. And beside it, I added my own little, my own little twist and a, and a notation for my own experience. For I went out into the world, and a story seized me. And that story was hunger. It was in 2003, in the midst of the, the Ethiopian famine, uh, the great, one of the great humanitarian crises of recent years. It was the Ethiopian famine of 2003. 14 million people were on the doorstep of, of, of starving to death in Ethiopia that year. I'd been a, correspond a foreign correspondent with the Wall Street Journal uh, for, for nearly 20 years uh, by that time. I'd been based in Africa for five of those years, had traveled frequently back and forth through Africa through, through, through many of the countries. Um, and I had seen hunger, but I'd never really stopped and, and, and noticed it or stopped and, and, and really paid attention to it. it. My time that I was based in South Africa was covering apartheid and was really focused on that. Uh, and hunger was just kind of the background of Africa, kind of the background noise, the, the, the wallpaper of Africa. And it's, 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 I'm, I'm ashamed of myself for, for having had that attitude for, for, for uh, so long uh, in, in kind of a general reporter covering things in Africa. And then I went to Ethiopia in 2003. And on my first day in Ethiopia, in, in Addis Ababa, I was at the, the office of uh, the World Food Program and was speaking with one of their officers, Voli Karuchi. And he was giving me a briefing about what we would be seeing in our, in our travels uh, into the hunger zones over the next couple of days, coming days. And as he was wrapping up, Voli gave me a piece of advice. It was kind of a warning of sorts, and it, it, it's etched in my brain. And it's been a motivating factor ever, ever since and a motivating factor for the book. This is what Voli said. Looking into the eyes of someone dying of hunger becomes a disease of the soul. A disease of the soul. What you see is that nobody should have to die of hunger. You know, wow. I mean, I, I had, as, as have all of you who have traveled to Africa, you receive an overdose of, of, of medical advice. I mean, get your yellow fever shot, uh, you know, take the malaria pills, watch out for standing water and the parasites you'll get from there, watch the cholera zones, be mindful of the meningitis season. I'd never before been warned about my soul and a disease of the soul. So the next day, Voli and I, and some other colleagues from the World Food Program, we traveled down to the, the famine zones. Um, and I discovered that, that, that Voli was right. In a famine, the starving speak with their eyes. They're too weak to speak, and so their expression is what's important. We drove up into the highlands south of Addis, and in an emergency feeding tent <clears throat> full of starving children, there I looked into the eyes of a, of, of a, of a young five-year-old boy, <clears throat> Hargirso was his name. Hargirso is the one in the right, in the, in the white shirt. <clears throat> it's kind of, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, he kind of has uh, a glow. Um, you know, uh, it, it's not photoshopped or anything, it's just the way the photo uh, came out. Hargirso weighed just 27 pounds. Five years old, 27 pounds, when he arrived at the clinic a few days before I had, had, had gotten there. He was a very portrait of, of famine. Swollen head, bone thin arms and legs. Same with the child behind him, pitiful state. And Hergirso's eyes, well his eyes were remarkable in a frightening way. They were, they were deep black holes. There was no hint of play, playfulness that you would normally see in a 